My guest today is Professor Susan Golden Meadow, who is Professor of Psychology at the University of Chicago. Her research interests include language development and creation and gestures role in communicating thinking and learning. Welcome, Susan. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, thanks for doing this. So I want to start with one of your recent papers from 2020, discovering the biases children bring to language learning. You said a linguistic input children receive has a massive and immediate effect on their language acquisition. This fact makes it difficult to discover the biases that children bring to language learning simply because their input is likely to obscure those biases. In this article, you say, I turn to children who lack linguistic input to aid in this discovery, and that is deaf children whose hearing losses prevent their acquisition of spoken language and whose hearing um, parents have not yet exposed them to sign language. This is really interesting to me, Susan. Uh, I, do, I know nothing about it, but uh, it, it seems uh, seems very intuitive uh, to me. So, so what do you find uh, from this type of data? So the children we're looking at are, just to clarify, are deaf children, profoundly deaf. They can't acquire the spoken language that surrounds them. And they're born to hearing parents. And their hearing parents don't know a sign language and hasn't haven't learned a sign language to expose them to it. And this, uh, this the studies I began were way before cochlear implant plants, and the children I studied weren't their hearing aids didn't help them learn the language. So in a sense, they're unable to learn spoken out language, and they don't have sign language to learn from. So you might think in that kind of situation, a kid would just give up and not communicate at all. But in fact, they don't because they're humans, they're human children. And what they do is they communicate with their hearing members of their family and they do it using their hands. They use their gestures. So another possibility is that they use the gestures that we all use when we talk. But those are very abstract and often very metaphoric, and it's not going to be very helpful for them. In, what they do is they create a gesture system. And this is each, it's not really a they, it's not a group of people. It's an individual living in a hearing home who's creating a gesture system that has many of the properties of language as that we see in a hearing kid acquiring spoken language or a deaf kid acquiring sign language from their deaf parents. So sign language is a sort of a structured language of gestures. Uh, in this case, the, the kids, is, is that right or no? Yes, I just wouldn't call them gestures at that point. I would call them signs because gestures signs. for me are, are, are the spontaneous things that we create. Whereas signs are established and they're handed down from generation to generation to generation, like, just like words. Okay, so so what's the difference in your mind uh, between signs and gestures? How do you differentiate them? Okay, so well, sometimes I call my the gestures that my hear my deaf children create home signs. That's the name for them. They are created in the home by the children, and the parents eh, sort of recognize them as signs. I mean, they they respond to them, but they don't always know that they're responding to them. They want their children to learn how to speak. But for me, a, a sign, a real sign, is part of an established language like American Sign Language, Finnish Sign Language, French Sign Language, Swahili Sign Language. All of these cultures have sign languages and they're different. They are not, they don't look like one another. Mm -hmm. um, whereas home signs actually have a lot in common because they call upon the iconicity of the real world, the transparency. You know, if they're going to talk about eating, they're likely to do something like that. And so would you if I asked you to gesture about eating. Hmm. Yeah, this is so interesting. So uh, this is sort of um, each child is, is sort of inventing a new sign language in the sense that they don't have exposure to a, a structured systematic sign language. And, and, and the only way they can communicate is sort of inventing their own sign language, is it? Yes, right. And so and that's why that yeah. the biases are there in the language because the children are not having to um, accede to the input that they're getting. They can just let out what they have in their own minds. Yeah, I mean, it's, I wondered, you know, there's some sort of evolutionary background here. So, 
when we started off, let's say 200,000, 300,000 years ago, um, maybe we didn't have structured language um, and we use sign language quite a bit. So this is sort of in the operating system of a human being, so to speak. Uh, it, so they can make some sense with signs or with gestures uh, right, right from the beginning, um, it seems to me, right? So a deaf child will start creating gestures in an, in an attempt to communicate, right? Right. Um, I mean, hearing children use gestures too before they can learn to speak. I mean, I think one thing we really have to worry about before we jump to evolution is that when I look at a deaf child these days or a hearing child these days, it's a modern mind that the child has. So we really don't know what went on 200,000 years ago when language was first being created. It might have been created by the hands. It might have been created by the mouth. More likely, it was probably created by an integrated system of both. Um, but I don't think my deaf children really uh, say that it's clearly a, a sign language that language came from. Hmm. They can see. Uh, and so they're living in a modern world. They have TV, they have yes. other visual uh, inputs. Yes. And so yes. this has to be an after effect of those yes. very, very, uh, uh, a lot of input there, right? From a lot of visual input coming into them. Absolutely. There's lots of visual input. Um, so they are not inputless. What they are lacking is a structured linguistic system. But all the other aspects of the modern world are there. And so you might think that the child would not be able to invent a language in that circumstance. I mean, if you think about it, if language were wiped out right now, all languages, signed, spoken, written, and we had lots of thoughts, but how could we communicate those thoughts? Would we? try to communicate those thoughts? And if so, would we communicate them in the way that language looks right now? Well, if, if language has to be handed down from generation to generation to generation and has grown up over this very long period of time, then you might think we might not generate a language. And if we did, it might not look like what our current language looks like. Mm. But if language can be reinvented or aspects of language really reside in us, then you might expect it to be reinvented. And that's what we find, that it is reinvented by a child. Of course, not a whole full-blown language. There are things that the children don't do, but the rudiments of a language, which I find very interesting. Yeah, so let me take a little bit of a detour here, Susan. Uh, so I often wondered, you know, language was very practical when it was invented. Mm -hmm. um, we had to communicate thoughts, we had to get things done. Uh, and increasingly, language became very complex, right? So we got, we got into literature, we got into very flowery language, uh, possibly that, is, that doesn't really have any practical applications, Shakespeare yeah, okay. and so on. Yeah. Uh, and so yeah. language is, has potentially evolved into something that's very different from its practical intent early on. Is that, is that true or not? Well, I, so, it, okay. Are you sort of asking whether somebody in the deaf child's position could create something like that? Because it has now, that, that aspect of language probably does depend on generations of, of people creating it. Now, the problem with exploring that in our deaf children is that they're children. So it might require sort of more an adult behavior. They do a lot of things with language that you might expect them not to. So for example, I've seen these deaf children gesture to themselves. You know, a, a child is looking for something and he, he's, he's just looking for something and he doesn't look at anybody, but he does a, a where gesture and then points to himself. Not looking at anybody, he's clearly doing that for himself. When I try to give him something, he doesn't want it. This is really a gesture for himself. So they can gesture for themselves. I've seen them gesture to their own gestures, you know, to make a, a face to represent Donald Duck and then to point at that face, which is sort of saying, I said Donald Duck. You know, so those are pretty abstract uses of language. They can do that. They can tell stories with their with their um, 
gestures. They haven't invented plays that I know, but of course, these are children. And so you'd have to look at home signers who are older, who are adults, to find out if um, people in this situation can invent it. I would guess you might need other people to do those kinds of things, mm. but we don't know. You know, so, you know, when we do introspection, um, a, a non-deaf person, I wondered if we're using language or we're using abstract thoughts. If it's the former, then a, a deaf child will, you know, sort of gesture to, has to gesture to himself or herself to do sort of that introspection, you know, thought process, right? Right. Well, you know, when signers do introspection or think about think, they often think in signs. And we have nice evidence from that, from slips of the fingers and whatever. Um, but I think that you're, I mean, if you really use your intuitive thinking, you can think in words, but you also can think not in words. You know, when you talk to mathematicians who invent these wonderful theories, they're not doing it using words. They say they're doing it using images and they might be using gestures, whatever, but they're not using words. So I think that, yes, we think in words at times, but we also think not in words. So when I find that my little deaf children gesturing to themselves, I think at those moments, there probably are times when they think in their own gestures. Hmm. But I think they certainly can think even without their gestures, just as you and I can. Yeah, and there's also a feedback mechanism here, right? So I don't know if you looked at, uh, if you have data on this. So I can imagine a deaf child's um, sort of development of um, gestures or sign language is a function of how the parents respond to him yep. or her. Okay. And if the yeah. parents don't have, you know, don't have any type of training in it, uh, it's a complex thing, isn't it? Well, okay. I think that's an, an excellent point. What the remember that these are children. They're res, they're in the real world. You know, they're talking about eating an apple. You know, they'll point at an apple and do eat, as opposed to the other way around. So there's consistent order in what they do. Okay. Um, I think it's extremely important that somebody respond to these gestures. Otherwise, why would they do it? It really is to communicate. But I don't have any evidence at all that it's the responses that are shaping the structure of language. So what we did was we looked for each individual child at whether the parents responded more often when the kid pointed at the apple and did this and did an eat gesture, or when he did eat gesture and then pointed at the apple. And we could find no differences. Nonetheless, the children tend to point at the apple first and then do an eat gesture. So they have structure that doesn't seem to matter for communication. Hmm. Nonetheless, I do think it's really important that somebody be listening or watching because otherwise they wouldn't do it at all. But the way in which they do it may be independent of the kinds of responses that the parents give. Now, I have a, a postdoc right now, uh, Ruthie Fouché, who is trying to look more deeply at that question and see if the parents respond in other, much more subtle ways um, that might shape the system in some way. And I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is really interesting research. Um, and so if, if the parents' response is not very critical, that implies that there is some sort of, um, I don't know what the right term is, there, there is, uh, it's almost instinctual for a human being, a, a deaf human being, to construct that language from scratch. It, it appears instinctual. Is that is that the way to think about it? Right. I think I actually would say that it is instinctual, but I'm not sure that it would that that instinct would come to fruition if you didn't have people around. I mean, maybe you'd use it to talk to yourself, but I doubt it. I think you need somebody around to try to communicate with, and then this structure will come out. But without another person, so so it's funny. I mean, I do think it's it, it's elicited, it's brought out by these conditions. But I don't think the way in which parents respond, the particular things they do, necessarily shapes the system. But you know, we'll see. We're going to do more research on that and see. Yeah, so, so you know, I was thinking. Yeah, so pointing to the apple first, 
and then uh, showing uh, he or she wants to eat it. Um, and, and, and you find that to be sort of consistent in all deaf children? We find it across home signers in the United States, also in China, in Turkey, and in Nicaragua. Now, and it's not just, you know, saying, okay, I want to eat this. They might use it to invite you to eat, in which case they point at the apple, do the eat gesture, and then point at you to indicate that they want you to eat. Um, or it could be just talking about the fact that there's an apple over there, and they might be doing this to, to talk about the apple itself. So it's used for a variety of functions. It's, I mean, one of the things that I think is very important, it's something that you mentioned before, language is used to get things done. And they use it for requests, no question. These are kids. But what's really interesting is they also use it just to comment on the world, you know, to say that the apple is round, to say that it is edible, to, to, to comment on the fact that mom's wearing a hat. Those kinds of things are very important these comments. And if, I mean, I think they're particularly important if you think about what are um, chimpanzees, what chimpanzees do and great apes do when they are taught sign language. These guys are taught sign language and they will use some form of signs to request, to get things done, to be tickled, to get an apple, to run around. They don't use it much to talk, to schmooze, to just sort of share information. That seems to be very, uh, sort of unique to human children and humans. Yeah, the, the, the dramatic construction here, which is you know, the object comes first and then the subject, um, is, is it appears well, in the action, yes, and then and the, the subject, action. Yes. I know yes. that certain languages, uh, the dramatic construction is in that way. I don't know which ones they are, but clearly in English and other uh, you know, common languages, it's sort of reverse, isn't it? Right. So for English, we do subject first and then the verb and then the object. Uh, in these sign systems, objects tend to come first and then the verb. Mostly they drop the subject. Mostly they don't talk about you or anybody who's doing things. But if in this one child who does it a lot, he does put it at the end, which is an odd word order for any language. That's O, V, S. But they often drop it. So it's the OV that's very important. I'll tell you about one other thing that's very striking and interesting. We asked hearing people who had a language um, to talk about a scene using only their hands. Okay. Um, and these are, we will ask English speakers, Chinese speakers, Turkish speakers, and Spanish speakers. Okay. So when they talk, they use the language, of course, that they, they use their language. So they either use SVO if they're English speakers or if they're Spanish speakers or SOV if they're Turkish speakers. But if you say to them, okay, now stop talking and just gesture to describe each of these scenes, mm. everyone uses subject, object, verb in their gestures. So when they create these, what we call silent gestures, they use this very consistent order. The OV part is found in the home sign as well, but it's subject, object, verb, independent of their language. That is really, really interesting. Yeah. It, again, it you know, goes to some sort of an instinctual reaction. Right. You, right. you know, language is a software uh, that we imparted on the, on the hardware at a much later time. And the hardware has you know, some sort of um, simple operating system. Uh, so perhaps it's an optimization question. If you want to communicate something with you know least amount of movements or whatever, perhaps that's the order. But once you have language, you're not really worried about it because you can you know can essentially do whatever you want right. uh, pretty quickly. Right. I think the the thing that's really instinctual is order. Although of course these hearing people might have learned about order from their spoken languages. But the fact that they use this same order is interesting and a little baffling. We don't know where that's coming from. Mm. You know, wh where is that coming from? Is that the natural way we think about these events? Mm, that's, that's going maybe a little too far. But it certainly is the natural way we express these events using our hands and, and probably using pictures too. We have some evidence for that. Yeah, there could be some interesting sort of neuroscience uh, basis there, you know, especially if 
if there is some optimization that's going on, that the brain in the absence of language wants to communicate. Um, you know, often we try to minimize cognitive cost, right, in communication. Mm -hmm. And the right. question would be, are we minimizing cognitive cost in this case by following an order? Right, right. And it's cognitive cost to us, the speaker. I mean, it right. might have helped the listener, and maybe it does help the listener, some listeners, but it isn't necessary for the listener. That's what my hearing parents show of the deaf kids. But it, it, it does lessen, I think, lessen the cognitive cost on the speaker. I mean, it also sort of suggests something interesting about when you go to a foreign country. If you go to a foreign country and you talk and you gesture, your gestures are probably gonna look like your talk. They're gonna follow that order. But if you just shut up and gesture on its own, you might, produce an order or produce a sequence of gestures that the person who doesn't speak your language is likely to understand. Mm -hmm. So I also wondered, Susan, I don't know if there's any data on this. Um, once you understand your child is deaf, yeah. uh, could the parents go through some sort of training, some sort of you know education to, to make that whole experience a lot faster, more beneficial to the child? Okay, so it, once you've understood that your child is deaf, probably the, well, what I would do, let's put it that way, what I would do is learn sign language. I would learn American sign language or, or you know, Finnish sign language if I lived in Finland or whatever, and I would send my kid to a school where the child would get sign language. And so sign language would become the language of our community. Now the parents that I, the, the children and the parents that I studied, I started this in 1972, so it was quite a long time ago. Sign language was not as accepted as it is now. And the parents were really pretty committed to having their children learn to talk. So they were sent to oral schools. Mm -hmm. Now it's hard for a deaf kid who's profoundly deaf to learn how to speak. Um, and that's more recognized now than it was then. And there were no cochlear implants or any of these very snazzy hearing aids. So the parents were being educated, but in a way that wasn't so useful for creating a gesture language. The parents were not told to slap their children, uh, my parents were not told to slap their children's hands if they used it to communicate, thank God. I mean, that was, you know, cause some parents are, you're told to just, you know, just use your voice and nothing else. But these parents used every aspect, you know, of their bodies and were happy to respond to their children's gestures. They just didn't use them their, themselves. So, so I'm going to go into, you have a book chapter, Approaching Learning uh, Hands First, How Gesture Influences Thought. And in this chapter, you say the gestures that speakers spontaneously produce as they talk are acts of the body, and as such have the potential to influence learning in the same way that bodily action does. But gesture differs from action in a number of important respects, and as a result, helps learners remember newly learned information and extend that information to new contexts better than action does. Yeah, so when, when I observe people, <laughs> so I, I see some of them using gestures a lot. Yep. Um, and some don't. Um, for example, I don't typically gesture <laughs> at all. And uh, and so there, there is sort of a, a, a difference, right? There, there are some some people who really learn by by that by that additional activity that they take up. So our intuitions are that there are people who gesture a lot and people who gesture very little. There's not been much study of that. And it's not clear to me that that is absolutely true. I think there are probably contexts that I could put you in where you would gesture. And there are contexts that I could be put, I'm a big gesture, but you put me in a context where I won't gesture. So we don't know really whether this is a personality trait, whether people gesture a lot or, or a little. We certainly know that in all cultures that we've looked at, people gesture. But again, people believe the folklore is that people gesture much more in Italy than they do in the United States. That's actually not been supported very well. Hmm. It turns out that what people do in Italy is they use emblems, you know, they use sort of more uh, static gestures. Emblems are things like 
thumbs up and an okay gesture that are conventional. Italians have a ton of them. A lot of them are rude, but you're, you know them, you learn them, and they use them a lot um, in addition to spon spontaneous gesture. But what Italians do is they're, they gesture big. They're, they're very big with their gestures, so they're very obvious. Whereas mm -hmm. Northern Europeans gesture much smaller. But if you look at the rates of these spontaneous gestures, people have found that it's roughly the same in Northern and Southern Europe. So our intuitions aren't always great. You know, so you may be a big, a small gesture, but you may not be. So you depends on the context. You may gesture. <laughs> so, so it seems to me that it depends on the context. So yeah. perhaps if you are in a very familiar context, no, I'm just making this up, I don't know. Uh, you know, you you have some level of gesture, uh, and when you're very unfamiliar context, maybe you gesture more or less. I don't know what the what the right uh, right thing would be, but emblems, as you mentioned, seems like a very efficient way to communicate. You don't have to talk a lot, right? right. You just have to show a sign. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, you know the little writing gesture that you do in a restaurant to get your check. Yes, those kinds of things are very efficient and they have to be learned. I mean, you, you have to learn that. You have to know that that's what you do in all cultures to get the check or in some cultures to get the check. Um, but they're different from the spontaneous gestures, which is the which are the ones that I study. Yeah, but you're talking about here how gestures allow you to learn better, learn faster. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, I, I just give the the chapter, I think you talk about not just language, but also math, mathematics, right? That that yeah. uh, even, you know, hard concept or abstract concepts, gestures appear to help learning those right. things. Right, so the, the way we look at it for language, it's in the little kids, you know, so a little kid, uh, when he can't even produce two words, might point at a cup and say, mommy, he doesn't think the cup is mommy. He thinks that it's mommy's cup. So by saying mommy and pointing at a cup, he's sort of producing a little two word sentence, mommy's cup. And it turns out that the sooner you do that, the sooner you will start learning, uh, producing two word sentences. And we've shown that if you encourage children to gesture, they're gonna increase the number of words they produce. So that kind of gesturing can help you learn language. But a lot of the work that I've done, you're quite right, is not on learning language, but it's after having learned language, how can you use gesture and speech to help you learn something else? So the phenomenon that we found, and the reason that I think it's relevant to learning, is because we've looked at children in learning situations, problem-solving situations, they solve a task, they get it wrong, they gesture, and we ask them why, they explain their answer, and their explanation is incorrect, and then they gesture along with it. Everybody gestures these particular problems, these math problems. Sometimes their gesture is exactly the same as their speech. You know, they say, I, I pointed, I, I pointed, I added the six and the four and the three, and I added the other three and I got whatever. And they pointed exactly the same numbers as they um, mentioned. But other children don't do that. They say one thing, they might say exactly what they what the other child said, but they point at a different set of numbers. Their gestures and their speech don't match. So when that happens, you might think they're confused. But actually what we thought was that maybe they know a little bit more, that they're not really expressing in their mouths, they're expressing it in their hands. So we gave them all instruction, and it turned out that the kids who produce these so-called mismatches we're more likely to learn than the kids who produce the gesture speech matches. Mm. So the gestures predicted who was ready to learn. Not the gestures per se, they all gestured. It was gesture in relation to speech. Remember, these are not the same kinds of gestures as I was talking about at the beginning. This is gesture with speech as we all know it. Yeah. So gesture with speech when it mismatches sig signals that the person who's producing it is sort of on the cusp of learning something. Hmm. So what they're talking about, learning about what they're talking about. Yeah. So so this has some implications for education, right? How we how we think about educating kids. Um, clearly there are personality differences, I would imagine, but if this is sort of predictive, 
then um, we could we could use that information to to teach kids better. I would think. Right. Right. Now it's not it's predictive of what the child. So if you produce a mismatch on this particular ta task, it is suggesting you can learn that task quickly. Hmm. That doesn't mean you'll produce a mismatch on another task. It's not a personality trait. It's really reflecting what you know about that task. So I think it really is good for teachers. And we've shown that teachers can pick up on this information and make use of it. I think good teachers do that all the time. They look at the gestures that children produce. They think about it in relation to their speech. And they make guesses as to how to then teach that kid better. Um, they may not know they're doing that. They're totally unaware that they're looking at the child's gestures but they do it nonetheless. So that's one way in which gesture can play a role in learning. Yeah. But gesture, I mean, if we make somebody gesture, that also plays a role in learning. We get them to gesture and that makes them more likely to learn if we, you know, if we use the right gestures. Yeah, I, I um, a little bit of a detour, Susan. I wondered if you had any data and I'm just thinking, you know, I came from engineering and economics into business and uh -huh. my memory, my memory is that in technology arenas, um, this is just 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 very <laughs> very anecdotal. In technology arenas, people appear to people people appear to gesture less. At least my observation. Whereas in business, everybody gestures. I mean, um, you know, our our recent president is a good example. He can't he can't talk without gesturing at all. Um, and so do you see any differences in sort of professional arenas um, in this context? So this is very interesting because my intuition is, is, is the opposite at some level. There are fields like physics, chemistry, geoscience, math, they elicit gesture like crazy. If you look <laughs> at a lecturer, who's not just reading his notes or her notes, but is actually talking, they gesture a lot. And, and I think it's in part because like in geoscience, how can you talk about all of those shapes and these uh, configurations without showing them? So people gesture quite a bit. Um, and I think actually w once they're in front of a class uh, trying to teach a concept, they gesture even more. And that's an arena I would really love to study. Uh, to see how professors or teachers or you know somebody who's teaching would use gesture to talk about science. Now I don't know, and I'd love to compare them to somebody who's teaching about literature. Right. Right, because that's really what you're asking. We haven't done it. Um, I think that I know that ling uh, professors of linguistics gesture quite a bit. They put their you know frameworks out there. I can imagine that if you're talking about Chaucer and you're thinking about it in a frame or in a you know a scene, you might do that as well. I mean, it really almost depends on your conceptualization. And if you're not reading, if you're just reading it and not thinking about it, you're not likely to gesture. Hmm. You gotta be thinking hard to gesture, I think. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I found the politicians gesture a lot even though mostly they're not thinking. <laughs> yeah, so if there's a good correlation. Sorry. They are taught to gesture, and I'm not sure what they're taught. Some of them are better than others. I, so, you know, George Bush's gestures were terrible, and Trump is terrible, terrible. So I'm not sure what they're taught. You know, not necessarily to do it like naturally. Yeah, I would ask you. I saw some studies uh, that, again, looking at politicians' gesture, um, we could tell when they're lying. And we could tell when they're not lying because those patterns appear to be very consistent. So any sort of machine learning algorithm could could say, you know, a typical politician when he or she is lying, but just looking at the patterns of hand movements. You know? right. uh, the, one of my colleagues was looking at um, right-handed versus left-handed politicians. Um, and they, you know, if you're a right-handed, you put good on your right hand, you talk about good things with your right hand when you're gesturing. And if you're a left-handed politician, you do the same with your left hand. But that's a little different from what you're saying about lying. I do have a student who looked at lying, not in politicians, in regular people. What she wanted to do is um, she, told, she showed them a, a cartoon. And then she said, all right, I want you to describe this cartoon. 
And on half the trial, she just des described it. The other half, she said, okay, I want you to just lie a little. You know, don't tell me that he ran up the stairs. Tell me that he jumped up the stairs or something like that. So what they would do is they would lie as she told them to do. But often, you know, that the stairs would come out in the gestures. So they wouldn't say it in their mouths, but they would in their gestures. So that's a case where the truth outs no matter what. Um, right. Yes, I want to go to another paper uh, from 2018, taking a hands-on approach to learning. And we talked a bit about this. So he said, when people talk the gesture, these gestures often convey substantive information that's related, but not always identical to the information conveyed in speech. Um, and so in some sense, this is a, an additional channel of communication, right? right? So, see, so you know, you're, you're talking, and you know that information is coming through, and then this is a this is sort of an enhancement, <laughs> in some sense, of that information that makes it easier to communicate. Is that the way to think about it? I don't know if it makes it easier to communicate. It depends on what you mean by easier to communicate. Yeah. I think what it is is um, it's expressing what you know explicitly. And sometimes you know you know things that are hard to get out in your mouth. You just at this point you don't you don't have explicit knowledge of that particular fact, and so it comes out in your hands. I think it does communicate. That is, you will look at me and understand what I'm saying because gesture is easy to read. But it's not clear to me that I did it to communicate with you. I sort of almost did it unknowingly because I know something that I just can't get out. Right, right. And so, so would you say then, when there's more uncertainty or more complexity in the content, okay. it is more likely that the communicator will gesture? I think they have to understand it. So if there's so much complexity that, the, that it's going over the, the speaker's head, gesture won't help. You know, right. they have to have an understanding of it. And if they have an understanding that's sort of just, it's an almost an implicit understanding mm -hmm. that they just can't articulate, then it, it might come out in gesture. And it might not come out in speech. So we have done things like we've told children, okay, next time you explain this problem, gesture. I want you to move your hands when you explain it. And they gesture more than they did before. And they also express new ideas with their gestures. And often those ideas are correct and they hadn't said them before. So just by being told to gesture, these new ideas came out. But yeah. not in their speech. No, no, so the classrooms, as you, as you mentioned, are good experiments because the teacher is trying to communicate with, let's say, 30, 40 people. And they're all different, different right. levels of comprehension, different levels of understanding, let's say. So how that teacher gestures, right. it, it's really interesting, isn't it? I mean, one-to-one right. one, one -to -one is more predictable, but right. one-to-many, I wonder how that works. Well, I think, you know, one of the interesting things we've found that's so surprising to me is that if a teacher expresses one idea in speech and a different, correct idea in gesture, so two different ways of solving a, a math problem, that's really good for learning. And it's good for learning for everybody. It's not the case that, it, that only the mismatchers learn from that or only the people who are ready to learn. It was good for everybody. So I'm not sure that you have to tailor your gestures to another person. I think what's a challenge in a classroom is that a teacher can read what a child knows off of the child's gestures. And so what you really want is you want all of your kids gesturing, but you can't have them gesturing all at the same time because <laughs> you can't look at them. So there are some tricks, you know, you can bring children up to the board, have them explain their answers and they will gesture. And then you can respond to them and, and notice what that child knows and talk about misconceptions and whatever. You can do one on one, kinds of uh, interactions with children and talk to them at their desk. Or you can put children into groups because they respond to each other's gestures. And often what is said in the group is said in gesture only 
but everybody gets it and then they share it. It's really interesting. I mean, there is an undercurrent of conversation that goes on with the hands that often people, you know, if you had a tape recorder, you wouldn't even know it was there. It's a skill, right? So I wondered, you know, um, people who, who don't gesture, let's say, um, profusely, <laughs> so to speak, okay. um, I wonder if they are a little bit at, uh, at a disadvantage in understanding gestures. It's a bit like being deaf in the sense that there is another communication channel that's open, but if you're not really tuned to that, maybe you're missing information. Maybe you're, you know, maybe you're just too focused on sounds right. and not that focused on gestures because there is an equally important communication channel that's open, right? Right. So, but we don't know. One of the things we don't know that you've sort of assumed in here is that the way you gesture reflects how you interpret somebody else's gesture. Mm. That's something we have to experiment on. I mean, partly we don't know that because we don't have a really good sense of individual differences in gesture. We talk mostly about what most people do. I'm sure there are individual differences, but it's not even clear what dimension they exist along. Maybe amount, but I don't know if amount matters. Maybe nature of gesture, we'd have to see. But the way in which you gesture may or may not reflect how you're gonna interpret somebody else's gestures. So it, you know, it might not matter that you don't gesture a lot. Although I would still question, I think that when you are trying to really explain something to somebody else, you'll gesture. Try you gesture, yeah. So, so when you're trying to communicate, uh, politicians, yeah. teachers, um, others, um, business leaders, let's say, when you try to communicate to a large swath of people, right, you probably have to gesture because you you need to open another communication channel. Whereas if right. you know two computer scientists sitting down and thinking about a computer program. Probably less so, <laughs> I think. Uh, I wonder. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. You know, David McNeil, who's a great gesture researcher, who's he's here at the University of Chicago, he just videotaped two mathematicians. You might think that they would just sit there and talk numbers or they gestured like crazy. <laughs> so I think we have to do the computer science test to make sure that you're right. Um, and I, you know, and as I said before, I think politicians often are taught how to gesture and that sort of mucks up their natural style often. Teachers are not taught how to gesture and I don't want to teach them how to gesture. I just assume they use their spontaneous gestures and do it as they do naturally. Yeah. We're good gestures in general, people. Yeah, yeah. I, I also wondered, you know, if you go back and look at, you know, the, the well-known scientists, um, Einstein, you know, yeah. or people like that, how yeah. did they, I mean, th these are people who dealt with abstract concepts quite yeah, heavily. Yeah. Did they gesture or did they really go to the blackboard and start writing, you know, partial differential equations, I wonder? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I mean, I have read a little, uh, you know, ma about mathematicians who are creative and often they say they're not thinking in words and they're not really thinking in symbols. They're thinking more in visual images. So if you're thinking in a visual image, it, it, certainly you can write it down and on a pic, you know, you can pic, picture it. But if you're also thinking about dynamic visual images, gestures terrific. So you could imagine the visual images being translated into gesture. I mean, that's why I think mathematicians gesture so much and, and physicists and things like that. Because, you know, when you have a static um, equation in front of you, if you're, if you know what it's about, you understand that there's a dynamic component of under, not underlying it. But if you don't, you don't. So when a teacher gives you that and conveys that dynamicness while explaining the static equation, I think that helps. Yeah, yeah. It's fascinating. So I want to go into, I'm going to finish up with uh, one of your, another recent paper, using gesture to identify and address early concerns about language and pragmatics. So you see speakers and signers naturally and spontaneously gesture when they use language to communicate. 
This gesture is not only plays a central role in how language is used in social situations, but also offer insight into speakers and signers' cognitive processes. You see, the goals of this article are twofold. To document how gesture can be used to identify concerns in language development, and to illustrate how gesture can be used to address those concerns, particularly with respect to pragmatic development. So, so there's a diagnostic component here. Right. Um, so before the child uh, starts to speak, we can observe, we can actually even de deploy some artificial intelligence techniques on this person, I think, uh, mm -hmm. that could have some diagnostic capabilities to say, you know, the child is behind the expectations, right. let's say. And then there is a sort of an intervention uh, question. If you identify the child is behind, could we bring her to uh, uh, bring her to a faster development scenario? So, 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 what do you what do you find here? Okay, so let me tell you one of the studies that we've done that really makes me think that gesture is useful. We were studying. We have a group of brain injured children who we've been studying alongside a group of typically developing children. So we have 53 children that we've been studying between the ages of 14 months and 58 months, typically developing. So we know what they do with their words early on and with their gestures early on. We have a range within which the typical children are. Then we have brain injured children. So we looked at the brain injured children and we looked to see whether they were in the typical range for words and in the typical range for gestures. And what we found, we, these 11 children that we first looked at were way below for words. This is early in development. Okay? They were way below for words. All of them were way below. But half of these kids were in the normal range for gesture. And half of them were below the normal range for gesture in the typically developing kids. All right, so this is at 14 to 18 months. We find they're the same, all low in speech, but they differ in gesture. Then we fast forward to 30 months and we have different assessments. We look at their words and we look at their gestures. And what we find is that um, they're, they're still different for gesture, but now what's interesting is that you find that the kids who gestured a lot at 14 months now are within the normal range for words. And the kids who didn't gesture at all are still at the bottom. So what this suggests is that these, and, and remember, they're all the same with respect to words early on. So you can't use their words to know who's going to need intervention and who is not going to need intervention. You can only use their gestures. So that's the study that I think really sort of suggests we could use these gestures for diagnosis and then perhaps for even for intervention. This is really important work, uh, Susan. So um, are these sort of practically used now, practically deployed? I mean, in a pediatrics um, environment, I would think these, these, this is very useful techniques, right? Yeah, I would think so. I would love to work with a doctor. I mean, the, all right, the big problem is doctors get to see their patients, you know, for five minutes and then they're off. You know, in five minutes, what can you assess? So we'd need to talk about what kind of assessment could be done that doctors can use. You know, how can we do it? Can it, can it be done in a doctor's office? Do we have to have them videotape themselves or whatever? I mean, I'd like to talk to them about how to make it practical. I believe that the information is useful, um, but I, I just think it's very, very difficult in, in, the, in the way we do our observations, um, our, our doctor visits, to make this useful, this information available to the doctors. But I don't think it's impossible. I just think we have to think about it. Yeah. I mean, technology is advancing quite rapidly, as you know. So home-based care is right. it's, it's really advancing. And if we can take care of all the privacy-related concerns, Mm -hmm. I would imagine technologies could be deployed to uh, to raise, uh, I mean, red flag might be the wrong word, but uh, to, to give early indications okay. that inter the child might uh, benefit from an intervention, right? Uh, yeah, five minutes in the doctor's office is not going to be sufficient, I would think, uh, okay. but, but you need some sort of constant monitoring that, that makes it uh, useful, I think. Right, we have to figure out whether 
I mean, most of these, you know, when we look at videotapes, we code them, we hand code all these things. So first we'd need to, to instruct a machine to be able to code the right things, um, to assess I mean, words are, are easy. You can get that on an audio tape and there are devices to figure out words. Gestures are a little harder, but I, I think that we're, people are working on it. So we might be able to get there. I think it's worth it. Yeah, so in conclusion, I know that you, you're working on a lot of these types of things. So if you look forward in you know, a few years, um, where do you think sort of the, our biggest uh, leaps in understanding knowledge will come in this area? I mean, you, you talked about a lot of different things here. You talked about uh, medical um, right. you know, um, applications. We talked about education applications, uh, and there is also sort of diagnostics and intervention in education uh, type right. things as well. Uh, so, so where do you think we will go from here the next few years uh, to, to make it more, more practical? I think that's a really interesting question. I want to talk about one more application that we haven't mentioned that I think is very important, and then we'll get more general. The law, interviews, because people are affected by the interviewer's gestures mm. and interviewers pick up on, chill, on, on gestures that their interviewee produces, you know. So you can say, you can use an open-ended question like, what else was he wearing? But if you do a gesture like this, then the, the person out there is likely to say, well, he was wearing a hat, even if he wasn't. So there's all, and none of that will be captured in a transcript, a legal transcript. So I think in those domains, it's important that we just recognize that gesture is happening in the situation, in a legal situation, and we need to just pay attention. I think also in clinical situations, their gesture is happening and we need to pay attention. In general, I think we need to raise consciousness about gesture. So I had originally thought that if I tell somebody to gesture, they're only going to produce gestures that match their speech. They're going to line up and gesture will no longer be a good indicator, be a good diagnostic, will no longer be helpful. It turns out not to be true. If I tell a child to just gesture more, in fact, often they produce more mismatches. Their gestures mismatch their speech even more because they're expressing ideas that they've never expressed before. So I think I'm not so worried anymore about bringing gesture into the focus and having everybody, you know, just pay attention, pay more attention to it. Because I think many of our subtlest ideas are expressed. It could be even be our prejudices that are expressed in gesture that we don't even know we're expressing, but somebody else is picking up on it. So I think, you know, where, where we're going to go here is to discover where gesture is useful, but also maybe make ourselves more more aware of it, and as you say, to have technology help us become more aware of it. That may yeah, be it's, it's a scientific discipline, uh, and it, it can complement a lot of different things, uh, as you say, the clinic, education, and so on. Um, very quickly, Susan, I, I, I wonder, I can see, I'm just thinking, there's a cultural component here. Um, I don't know. I don't know the data, but I would imagine some cultures gesture more than others, and there is a personality axis here. I wonder if there is, you know, extroverts tend to gesture more compared to introverts. I wonder. <laughs> so, you know, is yeah. there anything anything like that? We don't know that. I mean, you know, we don't know about individual differences. Um, you know, you could imagine that it, it, well, an introvert will talk less, and of course they'll gesture less because they're talking less, an extrovert will talk more. I, I think some of it has to do with the size of the gestures, too. Remember, we were talking before about Italians who are gesturing big, so their gestures are very obvious to the listener. Um, so some of it may be in style rather than in whether you do it. But I think that we need much more investigation about and, and many more studies of the individual differences that people display in gesture. People haven't really looked at that yet. And I think that could be a new frontier where we look at the individual differences, if there are some. You know, I mean, there will be some, of course, but if there are, are they important or not? Hmm. We don't know. We don't know. Maybe. Yeah, really, Maybe. really interesting research, Irina. Excellent. Yeah, this has been great, Susan. Thanks so much for spending time with me. Thank you for your interest. I appreciate it.